Whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, uh, Matt Clapham. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a principal product security leader. And you can follow me on Twitter there. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, estimating development security and maturity in about an hour. Uh, and I assure you at the end of this, I will have helped you develop a new skill. Uh, I make products more secure. And so this is a lot of uh, experience that I have putting all these details to get, uh, together in some cohesive format, uh, making a, a useful estimation tool out of it, and then kind of refining the model just with uh, experience. So how did I get here? Well, uh, I was in a position in enterprise IT where I had tons of teams coming to me, often at the last minute, uh, asking for some sort of security review, right? And they needed a way to, to figure out what the smoke was. You know, where's the smoke, where's the fire? And so I kind of started thinking about how to, to put a smoke detector together. I wanted to understand which ones were really kind of developed with security in mind. So I came up with these uh, four things that were recommended to me by Michael Howard and uh, added one more because he, I thought he kind of missed more on the, the testing side. And so uh, I started leveraging that experience, refining the model, uh, field tested it with some of our suppliers. And uh, after a while, it kind of became a, a good uh, rubric, a good uh, way to estimate stuff. So uh, this process here is not for noobs. Um, if you are a noob trying to do the estimation, you will get pwned uh, because it requires on somebody, it requires to have a bit of experience because you need to set the BS detector. If you don't have the enough background to know when a dev team is, is blowing smoke up your uh, other places, this could be a problem. You won't be able to use it uh, as effective. So uh, typically, though, you're going to want some experience in security operations, maybe development. Uh, it could be something in enterprise IT, uh, testing with like penetration testing or vulnerability testing. Uh, certifications help, but they're not required. But having two or three of these uh, is, should be enough to, to get through the estimation method. Like I said, it's really about having these experiences to tune your BS detector. So I'm going to phrase the, or frame these today in a series of stories. We're going to talk about three example scenarios. One is the 11th hour security review. We're going to talk about that company that was recently acquired. And we're going to talk about that internal dev team doing something security-ish or app-ish. They need something uh, security reviewed. So let me kind of set the stage, right? So this 11th hour security review, um, you've probably seen one of these before if you've been working in the security industry. It's like Wednesday in the afternoon. Somebody comes and says, hey, yeah, you know, we're going to do this thing. And we got a bunch of marketing collateral. It's supposed to go out Monday. Fun, I've got to do this security thing. You know, can, can you give me a hand to help me out here? Help me get it through. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's often developed by a third party, so there might be some external group involved. Uh, basically, you've got a requester who's disengaged in the whole security story. Next up, the acquisition. You know, it was a popular brand or a popular web application. Uh, they might have been doing DevOps or something like it for rapid updates. Uh, they have a real good brand recognition. They're very highly regarded in their particular niche. Um, maybe the, um, you know, the management wants to understand just, uh, hey, you know, to either maintain the security that they're doing today or to improve it, what's that going to cost? You know, how much do we have to do without re-engineering? And then finally, the internal development team, right? Some team uh, basically working internally to develop custom line of business apps. Um, maybe they've got some custom enterprise work that they've been doing. Their uh, management requested that, you know, to look into their current project, see how they're doing, maybe uh, figure out, you know, what areas they can improve security-wise. How much should we worry about that internal dev team and all the security stuff that keeps going on, right? Okay, so how many of you have seen at least one of these? Two? Three? Right. Okay, sorry. Eleventh hour? So last minute security review, uh, acquisition, okay, and then finally the internal dev team. Okay, right. okay, you, okay, you got the last two, all right. Um, so uh, agenda, we've kind of started into this, but you know, I'm going to give an overview. We'll talk about the key behaviors that I think really go into my estimation model. Uh, we'll talk about how to score it, talk about the pros and cons, ways you might be able to extend it, and then we'll kind of do a wrap up in ways that you can apply it today, even if you're uh, not regularly interacting with dev teams. So in order to do this in about an hour, uh, I've got a couple key areas here, right? You're gonna start with some pre-meeting research before you actually talk to the dev team. It could take five to 15 minutes. 
there'll be some actual meeting or discussion with the dev team, take 30 to 60 roughly. Then at the, final, at the end, there'll be take about 15 minutes to write up a quick report based on the findings that you have. And uh, when it's all said and done, you, know, you, you want to be able to say with 90% confidence that you're sure that's how they score out, so therefore you've got a good estimate of how much security worry you need to have. So and when you add all those up, it could be anywhere from 50 to 90-ish minutes, or as I like to say, about an hour. So in the pre-meeting research, it's going to take about five to ten minutes, and basically you're just kind of looking to see what they have. So maybe in that first case where it's that third-party marketing team, you can go and check out their website. Uh, they do software customization, but they have little public presence, right? It's more of a marketing website that they have, so you don't really find much detail there. Uh, in the acquisition case, well, you know, they've got a security info center. They've got all this detail about how they make a secure solution, how they operate it securely. And that internal dev team, well, they have some documents and some write-ups on their security features. So pay attention, there will be a test on the end uh, with all the details I'm giving to you about the different scenarios. Uh, and we'll, we'll use those to score the method at the end. So when you're meeting with the dev team, there's uh, going to take about 30 to 60 minutes. You're going to need to make sure you have the appropriate resources. So you're going to need people like uh, the dev developer or dev lead, a dev manager, maybe some of the test team. Uh, possibly the program manager who understands the features, the capabilities, how they're put together. Uh, remember, you want to establish some rapport because devs are often very possessive of their code and what they put together. Uh, you're going to get some status on each of the five behaviors that I'll relay in a moment. And then any sort of additional detail. There might be extra things they do to go above and beyond or little subtle things that they mention that indicate they're not doing everything that they should be doing on that behavior. So what we're going to do is you know, start with some sort of Opener, like, hey, just a few questions about your development practices and then we can be done. Uh, maybe start with a, uh, an icebreaker, like, uh, tell me about your technology stack. It gets the developers opened up, kind of get them talking about what it is they put together. Uh, builds that, uh, that understanding that, you know, as the, the person inquiring, or I don't want to call it auditing, but talking to them, uh, you're just trying to understand better what they do. So here's a sample agenda, right? You can start with uh, just kind of that five minutes of rapport. Maybe spend about a minute to make sure you've got the right resources. You need to have the key people who are going to understand how that product or that software package was put together. Uh, there's going to be some sort of technology overview, kind of understand how the technology of the actual system that is, as it's put together works. Uh, do all the probing questions. That's going to take 20 or more minutes. So figure, you know, five minutes of behavior-ish. And then finally at the end, some sort of wrap up, talk about next steps. It can be done in about 30 minutes. It typically takes me about an hour talking to the teams. So uh, some warning signs if you're getting into the meeting with the developers. Uh, I'm just the IT guy. Or uh, I'm the CISO, right? And don't get me wrong, I love CISOs. Are there any CISOs in the audience today? No? Former CISOs? No? Okay, one? Okay. Um, I, I love CISOs, but if they don't know how the product is put together, it doesn't help me at all. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, or they like to say that their software has no flaws. Uh, my favorite, uh, Bob does that for us, and so pay going to be popping up a lot here. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, and I've even heard stuff like custom crypto. Seriously, this day and age, we're still doing custom crypto. Unless you have a PhD in crypto, and I know a few people who have PhDs in crypto, but unless you are one of those people, don't roll your own crypto. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the five key behaviors. And these are things that we're going to look for as part of my method to make sure that we're kind of getting that estimate, right? So uh, you've heard of a lot of these at this conference, uh, different groups talking about application security, uh, changing security culture. Well, these are the five things that I look for that kind of give me that good yardstick. Uh, we're looking for developer training. So how are they training the developers to write secure code? We're looking for threat modeling, some sort of way to refine the design, make sure that they're not designing something insecurely. We're looking for uh, the static code analysis. What are they doing after they've designed and starting to instantiate that into code? How are they measuring, how are they checking to make sure they did a good job of that part? Some sort of security testing, some sort of dynamic analysis, um, could be semi-automated, could be completely automated, but something to tell them, hey, after you did all that design work and that build work and now you've deployed it, you still missed a few things or now they've got some, something there to, to give them a reassurance that they, uh, they may or may not still have problems. And then finally at the end, sure, their software might be perfect, but do they know who to call at 3 a.m.? So 
God forbid that vulnerability gets found and gets reported uh, through some channel, do they know which developer to wake up? So what we're looking for in each of these is a 90% confidence interval. Something we can say comfortably, yeah, I'm pretty sure they do it that way. Uh, you're looking for anecdotes, maybe a design pattern that they use, uh, maybe some other artifacts like uh, different ways they've described how they uh, keep consistency in their process. Uh, we're going to rate these as kind of positives, right? Things that, that help give assurance that they're doing it and they're doing it well. And then negatives, things that say they might be doing it on the surface, but they're really not putting the effort into it, not really putting the focus into it. We're looking for the nearest exit. So first and foremost, do they do the behavior? Ask the right kind of questions in the right way to get them to say, yes, we do this, or no, we don't. And for those other aspects of, uh, of the positives and negatives, pros and cons, and then move on to the next one. Right? If you're going to stick it to an hour, you've got to make sure that you uh, answer the question, get some uh, anecdotes, move on to the next one. So the first behavior, talking about training. So basically understanding how the developers are writing secure code. How do we make sure, how does that group make sure that they're writing secure code? And you can see a possible opener there, right? Do you train your developers in writing secure code? So uh, here's some suggested openers. And, and imagine in those scenarios I was talking about earlier, maybe for, for the first group, the, uh, the, uh, the 11th hour security group, uh, review, you can say, so uh, tell me, how, about, how do your developers undergo security training? Is it managed throughout the project? In the case where we're dealing with the acquisition, you might say, hey, does your company have a history of training developers and writing secure code? Or maybe in the internal team, you can say, hey, has your team used any of that secure development training that we have over there that's, that's free that the enterprise already has a license for? And so as you're going through this, we can look for some positives and some negatives. Things like uh, maybe they regularly go to a security conference, or uh, maybe there's some professional testing or uh, professional training they underwent. Uh, it could be something negative where they maybe they only go to a single conference, or maybe only one of the team goes to a single conference a year. And so imagine in the 11th hour, right? So the, no, they don't do formal training, but let's say Alice gave a presentation on security once, and uh, they, she forwarded some news articles about uh, how to develop securely. Uh, in the second case, well, uh, the, the acquisition, yeah, they do some training. Uh, noobs have to go to a class, uh, but the industry hires, it's optional. In that third case, uh, no, they don't have any formal training. It's uh, optional for testers to take if they want to. Okay, so some warning signs and exits. So if you see one of these, chances are you either have the wrong people in the room or they're just not really thinking about it. Uh, so it could be something like uh, every developer has a chat with our senior architect. Or uh, no, our compliance team requires that we do this security thing. So uh, it could be something like, uh, well, we don't need to worry about that because. And uh, the last one, my favorite, um, well, we sent Bob to a security conference last year. Any Bobs in the room? No? Okay. Oh, we are? Okay, thank you, Bob. <laughs> This counts. <laughs> um, they, they, usually they score a big fat zero, but we'll, we'll get to that at the end. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, threat modeling, right? You've seen, uh, I gave a threat modeling presentation earlier at this conference. There, or sorry, earlier, I guess, technically at, at Converge, but um, we did some threat modeling. Other people have talked about it. Uh, people are talking about the, the book that I would recommend as well. All good stuff. Want to make sure that the dev team that you're talking to is doing exactly that, right? So, well, some ways you can open that. So maybe in the first case with the 11th hour security review, you can say, hey, do you have a threat model for this? Because it would really help me understand how you put this together. Right? The acquisition team, you can say, uh, how did you design security in the product? Did you use any process? And the third, the third team, the internal dev group, you could say, so tell me, how did you design it to minimize security problems? So looking at that threat modeling topic, here's some, some positives and some negatives, right? Uh, things like they have a formal process, or maybe they use a tool. And some negatives like they're dependent on that one person, Bob. And so uh, the first case, right? No, they just got some ad hoc design review, doesn't really focus on security. Uh, in the second case, well, yeah, they don't use a tool, but they have a security architecture review committee that goes over, looks at the design as it's being uh, built and updated. 
Uh, in that third case, uh, the internal dev team, they've got a formal review process. It's, uh, it's not all problems are addressed, though. So, yeah, they do the work, but they're not necessarily following through. So some warning signs at exits. exits um, I'm sure you've probably seen many of these. Uh, my favorite is at the end there. Uh, um, we use SSL because obviously SSL v3 solves all the world's security ills. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, I mean, okay, so maybe it's an easier question to ask. Who hasn't heard that excuse? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Bob, again, thank you for, uh, for uh, doing that for us. Even, uh, we'll talk to you more about it when you get back from vacation. <clears throat> okay, so the third behavior. We've talked about training, we've talked about designing it, now we're talking to the actual build stage, right? This uh, static code analysis. So looking at the code as it, was, as it was written, using some tools that'll go through that, try to find problems, point out potential security issues like buffer overflows or uninitialized variables, things that could cause a security badness later on. So it could be simple, it could be more complex. But here's some openers, right? So maybe if I'm talking to the 11th hour security team, I might say, so, uh, how do you make sure the code you write doesn't have problems? Or the second team, I might say, hey, how do you identify security problems as early as possible in your development? In the case of that internal dev team, have you ever used a static code analysis tool like uh, that one that we already have over here in the enterprise? <clears throat> so thinking of the positives and negatives there, we might see things like, well, it's build integrated. That's great. Or it might be a negative like it's manual, it's ad hoc, they only do it once at the very end. Something that you know, implies that they're really not following through. And then in the first case, we could say, well, yeah, that 11th hour security review, the team that was building it, uh, they, they do something, they use what's built into the IDE, and compiler warnings are used as errors. So, okay, there's some positives there. Uh, maybe in the second case, uh, no, they have some custom rules for style, so that acquisition is trying, but they don't have a tool because they do Ruby on Rails. And they can't find a tool that does Ruby. In fact, honestly, I don't know of a tool that does Ruby yet, but I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I haven't seen one. <clears throat> and in the third case, the internal dev team, uh, yes, uh, but the rules don't specifically target security. Okay. <laughs> what? What we told to do is code analysis. You do great. What do you use? Uh, style Mint. <laughs> Totally, because <laughs> that, that totally solves all your security problems, right? Because if well-structured code is secure code. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you might see things like uh, we review every line of code manually. Um, if they're doing that more than about two hours straight, the quality is going to drop off precipitously after that. In fact, if they do it right before lunch, it's going to be awful because they're all going to be hungry. Um, uh, Bob does all the code review himself. Maybe that works when it's just Bob programming it, but when you have a small group of people or even a medium size or larger group of people, it's just not going to scale all that well. He's not going to be able to spot all the security problems, even if he's doing security conference this year. Uh, my favorite is, is that I picked on earlier is we use Lint. <laughs> we should lock your doors at night, but that's entirely... <laughs> So uh, dynamic analysis, right? And so imagine we're walking through, and these are the things that I'm, that I'm looking for in the method. Uh, we look, asked about training, checked for design stuff, talked about how do we build it. And then after that, there still could be stuff that made it through. Still could be badness that made it that far. So we want to look at, well, what tools and things are they doing to try to test after all that's put together to pick up on things that might have gotten missed. Because sometimes when you combine just the right set of elements, a new deus ex machina kind of event occurs, and something weird comes out of all of that. So you want to try to spot those problems. You want to find out. So imagine some openers here, right? Here's some suggested ones there. Um, talking to that first team with the 11th hour security review, I might say, uh, how do you make your programs more secure before you deliver them? Uh, the second team, the acquisition. So did you test for security vulnerabilities in your web application? And the internal guys, I might say something like, so do you use a web scanner that we have available? Notice I'm pointing to the stuff that's already available. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, some positives and negatives here. Things like, well, they regularly scan production. Okay, good, good. 
maybe they've got some uh, quality gating function. So those dynamic scans before things promote have to pass. And maybe we've got some negatives like, well, they only use a configuration scanner. Or they only focus on just the OWASP top 10. It's a good start. It's a good start. So in that first case, the 11th hour team, well, they're doing some, no, they're not really doing any dynamic testing, but they did some manual testing. Uh, Alice did some ad hoc testing with some tools that she found, um, but that was about it. The acquisition, well, yeah, they have it as a promotion requirement. You have to pass the dynamic security tests before it can go through uh, right in their continuous deployment system. Uh, and they participated in a bug bounty at one time. And then in the third case there, maybe that internal dev team, well, no, they didn't do any dynamic scanning particularly. Uh, they tried it once, but it broke all their stuff. And so here's some warning signs and exits, uh, things that, that, you know, lame excuses we've heard. Uh, maybe once a year they hire a firm to do a penetration test, uh, or they just use a patch scanner and that tells them all the vulnerabilities they might have. Uh, and then my favorite, not only do they just do an ad hoc patch scanning, but Bob does it all. So, Bob, good job. Um, okay, so we've gotten through four out of the five behaviors, and now we're getting to that last one. Uh, the one I like to say, how do you know which developer gets the call at 3 a.m.? Basically, it's saying, hey, you know, bad stuff happens. There might be a problem. There might be a vulnerability. It might be in your code. It might, it probably you know, be in your code rather than all of, the, of your dependencies that you have there. So how do you know who to talk to? So in that first case, the 11th hour team, I might ask them something like, um, how would somebody report a problem in the program that you delivered? Maybe in the, the team that's, that's the acquisition, I might say, so uh, is the contact point you have listed on your security info center, is that manned 24-7? And in the case of that internal dev team, I might say something like, so who carries the duty pager? Uh, some positives and negatives there. Things like, well, they have that trust center. I have, I've talked about that a couple times with that acquisition. That's goodness. Maybe they have some negatives like it's only kind of informal or ad hoc. They haven't really thought about it. They know they might need it, and they figured they'll just wake the VP up or something like that. <clears throat> Or maybe they only think that it's just about middleware and patches. I always drill into the point that, okay, which developer gets the call at 3 a.m.? Because, yeah, you know, your ops team already has the, the patching of the base operating system covered. I want to know if there's a problem in your code that you wrote, who gets that call? So in that first case, well, no, they just do some, you know, customer service stuff that uh, goes straight to the sales and marketing guy. And if he deems it's a problem, then maybe it gets forwarded on to the developer. So for the acquisition, yep, they've got that contact point. They've got incident response uh, that deals with uh, patching, but not their homegrown code. And uh, they've got an escalation process that can get it to dev. So if it gets through the different paths, it can make it eventually to the development team. And those internal teams, well, yeah, they've got, uh, they do some, they've got a response process, uh, but they have a single point of contact. It's Bob. Uh, he's at a conference right now, but, you know, that's okay. They know how to call him. Um, and it's not a group, so they don't know where to go if Bob isn't actually available because he's on the plane back or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, we've all been Bob. Excellent. <laughs> I've often referred to myself as Brent, if you're familiar with Brent from the, uh, the Phoenix Project. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, anyway. So, uh, you know, here's some warning signs and exits. Um, you might see things like, well, our ops team does, takes care of all that. We don't need to worry about it. Uh, nobody's ever reported any vulnerabilities to Bob, so you know, what do we have to worry about? Uh, and my favorite, we haven't been hacked yet. I always, as politely as I can, ask them, so uh, by what evidence do you base that assessment? Okay, so going through each of the five behaviors, we've talked about how to, how to score it, how to, what things to look for, uh, now we're going to actually get into the put a number on all of that detail that you gathered. So, we know what to look for, we know what to ask, we know what the, the pros and cons are, so now we need to put a number on. So, uh, I'll try to explain this and then it'll do some examples so you can actually get some real time kind of a walking through and, and thinking through the method yourself, which is how I can tell you that you'll have learned a new skill when you leave. 
So uh, first, you can review your notes and your evidence, right? Because you took good notes while we are having that meeting with the dev team, right? Uh, and the scoring just starts at zero. It's real simple. If they didn't have any of the behaviors, that's a big fat zero. It's just zero, move on, done. Uh, for every behavior that they said, yes, we do that, and they can provide some sort of uh, verbal evidence at least, that's a plus one point. So if you did a behavior, you get a point. Uh, you average out the modifiers with the positives and the negatives, right? So all those little subtle things we were picking up on, things that imply that they're doing better or worse, you're going to take all of those, and for every positive if there, that has a matching negative, that's a, that's a net, net zero. Uh, it doesn't change it at all. And then you, you look at, well, is it pro or con? And then um, basically that gives you a range of zero minus to five plus. Uh, worst I've personally ever seen is a zero plus, and the best I've seen is a five plus. So I have seen a five plus team before. So I, I promise you we'd do some examples, and then after that we'll talk about those individual teams that we've been discussing uh, this whole time. So uh, first example, here's the detail. You kind of run through, I'll give you a moment, think through how you might score that. Okay, who's got one, for example, one, one, two, three, twos, okay, I would call that a two plus. They've got two of the behaviors, and if you kind of average out the pluses and the minuses, it works out to a plus. Because for every plus that has a minus is a, is a neutral. And then if you have more pluses than minuses, it's a plus, and then similarly more negative. So I would call that a two plus. Okay, so example number two. Starting to make sense? Okay, uh, sure, excellent question, Wolf. So, yeah, yeah, because you've got a yes, a yes, and a yes, and a yes, so there's four. And then you've got a plus and a minus, so that's, that's a neutral. You've got a minus there. You've got a plus and a minus, so that's another neutral. Oop, let me go back, sorry. Bumped on the pointer. You've got two pluses here, and then you've got some pluses and minuses. So when you average out the pluses and minuses, you end up with one extra plus. So I would call that a four plus. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad, uh, four minus. Four minus. Yeah, when you do the math on the pluses and minuses. And that's the tricky part. Yeah, the one more minus than plus, thank you. So I would call that a four minus. Yeah. And it takes a little getting, that's, that's why I put in these examples that are simpler and straightforward, because we're going to move on to. So basically, your scoring is saying how many of the behaviors are yes, and then you're saying overall, are they doing more bad things than good? Bingo. Average out the behaviors numbers, and then are they averaging in the, the positive side or the negative side? Yep. Okay, so I've been giving you subtle details about each of these as we've been running through them. Uh, hopefully you're paying attention. If not, I made it easy. Here's a chart of the things that I mentioned, the high levels, the high points. So uh, I'm going to take another sip of water. Um, think through, score it. Tell me what you think. This is the 11th hour security review. Hmm. I think everybody's experienced these, that's partly why. They are um, they are both contrived and uncontrived all at the same time. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, I would call this a one. I agree. Would you call it a one plus or a one minus? Okay. The, now we're starting to see because I would call that a one plus because you've got some things here like Alice gave a presentation. Uh, they do some stuff like compiler warnings as errors. It's not perfect, but it'll catch some of the security warnings that are coming out of the compiler. 
Um, Alice did some ad hoc testing, so good for Alice. Uh, but they've also got some things like the customer reporting, right? So when I average these out, I call it a plus. But as you're seeing, the plus and minus is that kind of gray area where it's open to interpretation. We can all agree that the one is this, yeah, they didn't, that's the one thing they did. But the other ones kind of vary, and that's why I say it's not for noobs, you need to have a good BS detector. Okay, everybody ready to move on? Okay, second one, the acquisition. Ready? Who's got five? Four? Okay. Threes? No, fours. Okay, so we locked in on four. Good. Uh, plus or minus? Really? Why? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I would call that a four plus. They got a lot of positive things up there. I mean, basically, you had me at, at Security Info Center. <laughs> um, yep. Yep. Okay, so finally, the internal dev team. Two, three, okay, five, all oh, three. <laughs> Sorry, I misread your figures. <laughs> oh, okay, my, my mistake. Like, really, why would you call that a five? Okay. <laughs> all right, so three. Uh, this is where we get into the interpretive part. Uh, plus, minus, or neutral? I, could call, I would call that a three minus, maybe a three flat. There's some stuff in there that you might, you know, say it's a flat, but I would call that three minus. Yeah, okay, so see, you just learned a new skill. Now you can do this. Okay, so what do we do with it all? We've done all that. We've got no behaviors to look for. We can do the estimation. Uh, now we've got to do something useful with it. Now we, we have to report it back. So what I like to do is to, you know, leveraging those notes, just kind of make a, a quick summary. So after the, the meetings are all done, Go back, look at my notes, uh, just kind of briefly recap what those five behaviors are and what the team answered. So that if there's any question, you can say, hey, this is, you know, this is what they said. Uh, referring to that evidence, right, that, in that notes. Uh, score the positives and the negatives. So we kind of give them a, hey, that based on my estimate, this is where I would say it's roughly at. And then explain what that means, because teams are going to look at that, or the requester is going to look at it and say, yeah, that's nice. Right, especially in that 11th hour security review that's done by the marketing team, they're really not going to care. But you can get them to, uh, to understand that they don't score very well and you get to sign off on the risk. Um, optionally, this is very helpful for dev teams. It kind of give them some feedback saying, hey, you know, if you did these couple things, it would, it would buy you a lot. Or because you didn't do these things yet, it doesn't count. Um, okay, so some tips and tricks when putting it all together. Um, obviously, be respectful, uh, flexible in the questioning. Uh, I like to, using that rapport, try to, to put in little things that I heard them talk about. 
try to put it a little more contextual. Uh, obviously, you have to leverage your experience to spot the misdirection. So if they're lying to you or trying to say that Lint is their, their security checker, um, you have to know enough about that background to be able to catch it and, and as politely as possible call them on it. Um, uh, as technology people, we often love to get caught in the black hole of a discussion. Oh, did you hear about that cool new thing that they're doing in Ruby? Or, you know, pick a language here. Uh, avoid those. That's why it's really about behavior, supporting evidence, move on. Um, I always find active listening is very helpful. So, okay, so what I hear you saying is you don't do this, but you've got these other things, right? It gives them a chance to correct you if you're wrong. And also, make sure we're all in agreement. That's what you said. Um, and then uh, I also like to seed memes. So those things that I was mentioning to the internal dev team say, hey, are you guys using that static anal analysis tool that we already have over there? It's a great way to, if they're not using it, now they know. Uh, so kind of go over what this is and isn't. Um, for me, it's, it's mainly a smoke detector, right? It gives me a, a rough estimate of, hey, where things are at. It's relatively fast. I can do it in about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, usually a creator of more action items. People need to take it and then figure out what are they going to do about that. Do they care about the score? Do, do they, does it mean we have to do more review work? Does it mean that the, whatever the thing is that people put together isn't of great quality? They need to decide. Um, it, uh, it's not a full maturity model, right? I'm, it's just five things you're looking for. It doesn't mean that you've got a secure development process. It just means you've got five behaviors that, you know, and my opinion and opinion of a, a, a friend of mine who, who's you know, written books on this stuff says that, yeah, these are some things you should be doing. Um, it's by no means a compliance order or standards based or any of that. It's just a smoke detector. And that's what I try to use it as. So uh, comparing to some of those actual full maturity models, um, one of them uh, that I'm fond of, although it certainly has its, its limitations, is the building security and maturity model. Uh, BSIM, uh, anybody here familiar with BSIM? Wolf, a uh, couple of you, okay, good. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, based on actual usage, what companies are really doing. Uh, last count I heard, they had around six dozen different companies they were asking about. Uh, it's certainly biased to the population as it's assessed. So they look at the behaviors of those six dozen companies and say, what are they doing? Well, that's what, you know, everybody in this population is doing. They don't look at anything outside of that. Uh, they, they consider it across four key domains, and they have an uh, individual maturity level for each of those domains. And to get a full BSIM done takes two to four weeks. It takes a lot of time. Uh, another one, <coughs> excuse me, another one that I heard has uh, recently been updated. <coughs> Sorry, get a little froggy there. Uh, 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 the Open Software Assurance uh, uh, Maturity Model, or Open SAM. Uh, this is one that's a Creative Commons license, so you can go out and grab it yourself. They got a bunch of templates uh, that are already set and ready to go. It's a little simpler than a BSIM, so it doesn't take quite as long. You can do it yourself with the templates and whatnot, and it takes probably two days to one week, depending on uh, availability of resources to, to really focus on it. Now, take my method, and for just a few hours more, uh, you can put together stuff like a suggest some training, some resources, uh, maybe provide a formal list of recommendations, talk about the vulnerability history of their software dependencies, maybe kick off a maturity improvement program. Say, hey, you know, you guys, you, get, you need some work, so here's how we're going to help you. And then um, maybe refer to that formal maturity assessment if it's not just an improvement program, but it's also a, and we, we need to deep dive on one of those other methods. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, we talked about how my method came about, gave you an overview, told you about the five key behaviors, and we went over scoring and reporting with real examples, so now you actually can do it. And uh, we talked about the pros and cons and adding a few extras. And so now the, here's how you can make it useful. Um, some things I might suggest is uh, take and use it for your next last minute security review. Say, hey, hey, you know, can I have like just a quick conversation with the dev team and, and go over the things, right? Uh, maybe in the next three weeks, you could start to use it as a triage for an application security review, which ones really need more in-depth look at, because if the team's doing all that great stuff and they're scoring a five plus, you probably don't need to worry that much, right? They, they pass that level of smoke detector. Uh, and then maybe in three months, you could actually start to formalize it as an estimation process for your company's AppSec review team.
um, with that. Any questions? Comments. Comment. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Thanks, Wolf. That's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about how that could apply to Agile and make it a, just a, a quick, hey, what do we do next kind of a thing. Right. Yeah, on the 11th hour security reviews, that's usually I'm coming in blind at the last minute. So let me ask you this. Uh, I appreciate that feedback. Uh, obviously, the, the assessing the different parts. Yeah, I think we've, we have a lot of heads nodding. I'm sure we've, we've seen a lot of that. Um, is there anything in here that would help you? Oh, yeah. OK, good. How will you communicate that to your customers? <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Well, asking them about that instant response process will certainly point in the direction you know, and start to answer those other questions about know, the other behaviors, you know, too. Have you ever had this before? You know, I bet, you know, you know, you ever had this before? You know, how did it come through? Was it an email? Was there a support team? No, it goes to marketing, and then they just, you know, forward the email. <laughs> get them to pay attention. But. <laughs> well, 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 I've had an incident with, where security researchers have got this line about what they said or not said. You know, the disclosure timeline was like... I've got a whole you know, different talk about that part. You know, no, that doesn't fail. I mean, I've seen, you know, I've seen researchers cause develop, you know, certain types of researchers cause developers to not want to have it's certainly a reaction. Uh, some people, yeah. when they get told their baby is ugly, uh, have a right. big, strong pushback. So it's, yeah. uh, I, I try not to tell them their baby is ugly. Uh, I like to say that pediatric rhinoplasty is all the rage right now. We think about downstream of, of this the five behaviors here, it's things that help imply that they're making a secure product, whatever that product may be. And if you're making a secure product, that's going to help uh, prevent brand damage. Okay, well, um, we can certainly talk more after, yeah, yeah, but I think it's time for them to cut the video feed, so. <laughs> that and, <laughs> it's, it's like 6 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you so much.